<laughs> Welcome to worship on November 15, 2020. We will, we will take the service straight through as we had originally planned it for this morning. But since there is a recent surge in coronavirus cases and it's touching the members of our church, we've decided to close the sanctuary to congregants this morning. So I welcome all of those who are joining us via YouTube. I encourage you to use this recording to spend time with God today. I hope it will nourish your spirit and feed you with the stuff of hope as we face into a challenging winter together as God's people. I now call us to worship. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, my, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. the gifts you have given to each of us for service in your world. Gifts of teaching, healing, inspiring, caring, repairing, maintaining, and making among, and making are among the many talents you have placed in our lives. Direct us to use our gifts to reach out to our neighborhood and nation witnessing to your love and your healing mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
morning's scripture reading is one of the parables that Jesus tells in the Jerusalem temple after his celebrated entry into the city on a donkey, which we remember when we celebrate Palm Sunday, and before he is arrested by the authorities and crucified. The parables in this series of parables speak to Jesus' impending remove from the earth and his anticipated return back to it. Last week we read the parable of the ten bridesmaids waiting to meet the bridegroom. And you remember how the bridegroom was delayed in coming to the wedding banquet. Last week we saw that some were let into the wedding banquet while some were left out. In this morning's parable, we will again see the themes of grace and judgment being worked out in the telling of the story. In the story, a man goes on a journey and leaves his considerable wealth in the hands of three of his slaves. To the first, he gives five talents, to the second, two, and to the third, one. We think of talents as abilities we possess. But in the context of the parable, it would, as it would have been heard by the first listeners, a talent is a huge sum of money. One talent is equivalent to 6,000 denarii, or the earnings of a day laborer for 20 years, 20 years worth of wages, one talent alone. So five talents are the equivalent earnings of 100 years. Each talent represents a super abundance of wealth that the three slaves are entrusted with. Hear now the parable of the talents. For it is it, it is as if a man, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See? I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow? and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, 
more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I, enjoy, I um, invite Dolores Sutton to present us with a stewardship moment. Good morning. The passage that was just read is one of my favorites, since it describes what I think stewardship is all about. We are a very generous church family. We pledge, we give gifts to those in need by donating money and items to others. But stewardship is more than that. The passage reminds us to use our God-given gifts in the service of God and to care for what God has given us. Stewardship is also giving of ourselves by volunteering our time and our abilities to our church family and our community and by doing the things we know are good and right. Even something as simple as calling someone just to check in, sewing and donating masks, which many of us have done, or caring for our earth by recycling. All of this is stewardship. Enjoy the day and do something for someone today. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Did you want to sit down just because oh, sure. you're being, I take my mask off. Go ahead, take a seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let us pray. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds upon the scriptures be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jack's wife, Rebecca, is in labor for triplets. Jack feels helpless. He asks a nurse what he can do to help. She says, you can pray. He goes to the hospital chapel, stands before the altar in front of a lit row of candles, and begins to speak aloud to God. He talks about when he was a boy in church watching his father praying. His father was an alcoholic, often cruel, sometimes violent. His son watched him praying silently in church. Now Jack is about to become a father himself, and a nurse has suggested he pray. He tells God that his father would pray so hard in church that the veins would pop out on his neck. But, he tells God, nothing ever changed. And so I gave up. I gave up on praying. I stopped. And he expresses his anger at God. He expresses his disappointment in himself. He expresses his love for his wife, how his happiness depends upon her. He tells God, if you need to take someone's life, take mine. Don't take her. Don't you dare take her. I am in my living room watching this scene unfold on TV. It's a scene from a fall episode of the NBC drama, This Is Us. And I say aloud to Jack, who are you talking to? I say this not because he is angry at God, not because he is expressing that raw emotion, but because he has so misjudged the character of God. He believes in a God who wants to hurt Jack or kill Rebecca. When I say the word God, that's not what I'm talking about. I know God as someone who wants to help Jack, someone who has created a person as lovely as Rebecca. I don't know who Jack is talking to. Jack understands God through the prism of how his life has worked out up to this moment in time. Things have been taken away from him for no reason. Moments of happiness, love, and familial warmth have been repeatedly disrupted and destroyed by his father's rage. We learn what we live. 
His life has also been blessed by his marriage to Rebecca. They've been happy together. But Jack doesn't know God as the provider of blessings, the giver of the superabundance of wealth that's been entrusted to him. Jack knows God as the one waiting in the wings, always waiting to snatch it all away. He believes he needs to protect himself and his unborn children and his wife from this killer and destroyer God he believes in. The third slave in the parable Jesus told knew a different master than the first two slaves knew. The third slave, like Jack, believed that the one who exercised absolute power over him was out to get him. The third slave believed his master was waiting in the wings, always waiting to catch him or in a mistake and punish him for it. While the first two slaves doubled the money the master entrusted to their care, putting it to work in the world, the third slave was too afraid to do anything with it other than hide it in the ground. He buried the wealth entrusted to him the way one might bury a corpse. He failed to realize the living potential of what he'd been given. He never witnessed the growth potential of the gift because he cut it off from the world, cut it off from the ability to change. Essentially, he killed the talent that he'd been given. He was afraid. He was afraid of what would happen to him if he made a mistake, suffered a loss, or was unable to return the talent to his master upon his master's return. How had life taught him to fear? Had he lost a few coins as a child and been severely punished for it? Had he made a mistake and been cruelly beaten? How has life taught you and me to be afraid? How do we overcome what fears, those fears that are holding us back? How do we free ourselves to move into the joy of our master? the joy God desires for each and every one of us. Jack gave up on prayer, gave up on continuing a relationship with the living God because his father prayed so hard that the veins popped out of his neck and yet nothing ever changed. I think we must be willing to live in a world where we don't control God where there is nothing we can do to exercise ultimate control over our lives and circumstances. As we search for joy, there is no substitute for practice, for returning again and again to our relationship with God, not the God who is waiting to hurt us, but the God who is so eager to help us. There is no substitute for gratitude, for seeing God's hand in all that we've been given instead of all that we've lost. There is no substitute for humility, for acknowledging our efforts as lowly service to a greater good for all humanity. Last weekend, the comedian David Chappelle was the host of Saturday Night Live. And his opening monologue was alternatively satirical and tender. And towards the end, he became serious and said, for the first time in the history of America, the life expectancy of white people is dropping. Because of heroin, because of suicide, he said, all these white people out there that feel that anguish, that pain, they're mad because they think nobody cares. Maybe they don't. But let me tell you something. I know how that feels. I promise you I know how that feels. If you're a police officer and every time if you're a police officer and every time you put your uniform on, you feel like you've got a target on your back. You're appalled by the ingratitude that people have when you would risk your life to save them. Oh man, believe me. Believe me. I know how that feels. Everyone knows how that feels. I just hate that feeling. 
That's what I fight through. That's what I suggest you fight through. You've got to find a way to live your life. You've got to find a way to forgive each other. You've got to find a way to find joy in your existence in spite of that feeling. End quote. I would add that you've got to find a way back to a relationship with the living God who cares deeply about you. We learn what we live. Our experiences shape our beliefs. But it's equally true that our beliefs shape our experiences. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In contrast to the third, the first two slaves were fearless. They didn't hesitate to trade with the talents they'd been given, to engage them in commerce with the wider world. Robert Kennedy said that only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. The third slave didn't dare to achieve anything at all. He blamed his fear upon the character of his master. But his master was the same master the first two slaves had. Eager though he was to blame the master, the parable is structured to create our anticipation that the third slave would have been welcomed into the joy of his master, just as the first two were, if he had only realized the potential of the one talent given to him. The point is not how little or how much is entrusted to us to work with or handed over to the master as, as benefit upon his return, but whether each slave has worked boldly to grow what has been entrusted to him. Whatever our talents, are we working to grow them? Earlier in the Gospel according to Matthew, we hear Jesus say, Blessed is the slave who his master will find at work when he arrives. Even though the master has been away for a long time, the third slave has nothing to show for it. Instead of owning responsibility for his fear and his laziness, the third slave places the blame outward upon the character of the master. He tells the master he was too afraid to do anything with his talent because the master is so harsh, reaping where he did not sow, gathering where he did not plant seed. His main concern was preserving, securing what he had been given. Maybe he needed the advice of Hunter S. Thompson who wrote, Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride, end quote. In the world we live in, many feel toward God as Jack did when he was scared to lose his wife. Many feel that their pain is being ignored. Many feel that God is against them or has it in for them. These are tough times for us to travel through as a people. The virus is spiking. The country is fiercely divided. It's strange to be reading a parable about getting out there and growing your talents or doubling your money when it's not really that safe to be getting out there. We are facing into a winter when we will most likely be staying at home. But the message holds your ability and mine to perceive the potential of whatever blessings we have now and to perceive God as the one who has plans to help and not to harm us, but to give us a future and a hope, has power to transform 
and to change our circumstances. The pull to preserve ourselves, to secure ourselves, until all this is over is a strong pull. But our master expects us to be changed, to grow, to be transformed by these circumstances, and to transform and change these circumstances through our belief in a loving, giving God. Amen.
Turn the hearts and minds of our leaders and our enemies to the work of justice, to a harvest of peace. May the peace you left us, the peace you gave us, be the peace that sustains us, the peace that saves us. We pray for those who are in pain, especially for Frank, whose leg has been amputated, for Jane, recovering from surgery. Heal them in body, spirit, and mind, and let the pain be lifted from them. We pray for all who are infected with the coronavirus, especially Leslie and Dean. May their symptoms be mild and their recovery speedy. We pray for all those who are prone to depression, especially as the days grow shorter and colder. May they drink in whatever light there is. May it warm their minds to joyful moments of memory. We pray for our police officers and all those who serve their communities at great personal cost to themselves. May they receive words of praise and encouragement, acts of kindness and appreciation. We pray for ourselves that we may be able to do more than we think we can do, that we may face the challenges of these times with grace, that we may be willing to grow in our love for you and be transformed by your love for us. Lord, together as one people, we lift all our prayers, spoken and unspoken to you, and ask you to hear us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. <clears throat>